So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Laura Alliance panel about Laura One empowering supply chain management. I'm Pierre Gelpi from Semtech, and I will be moderating this panel as part of my role as logistics chair of the marketing and working group uh, in the Laura Alliance. Among the panelists, we have two other Alliance members, Senet and Oxit, and Vianix, who is a Semtex partner in the supply chain space. So from Senet, let me introduce Karen Tilson, who is VP of Business Development. From Oxit, we have Josh Cox, the CEO, and from Vianix, we also have the CEO, Jay Talreja. For the agenda, I will start with a very brief introduction and then each speaker has six minutes and we will keep eight minutes uh, at the end for the Q&A. So the Laura Alliance is a nonprofit organization gathering hundreds of members, including major ones like Alibaba, Amazon, Orange, Tencent and others. It has three main missions. The first one is really to standardize the Laura One open protocol. Second is to certify products to ensure interoperability. And the third one is to promote solution from members. This is what we are doing today. The first question about Laura One is always coverage. Today we have more than 130 Laura One operators and more than 150 countries with Laura One networks that are available. And we will see later that networks can be either public, like what we are used to with cellular networks, and they can also be private, like what we are used to with Wi-Fi. Today we have reached tens of millions of connected devices across many applications. These are the six verticals that we are focusing on as part as, as, as the Alliance, the Lower Alliance. And today, it's really about asset tracking for supply chain that we'll be talking about. If you are not used to uh, LoRaWAN technology, let me just uh, mention a few benefits, starting from the right of this slide. So um, LoRa means long range. So it's both coverage in, in rural areas is really impressive, but also uh, indoor penetration in buildings. Then, of course, battery life is a key strength of LoRaWAN as well. Security and firmware upgrade over the air are very important in all IoT projects. Geolocation is key, especially for asset tracking, and, and this is the topic today, so it will, it will come back in the presentations from the panelists. And uh, I've already said, and I will uh, repeat in the next slide, uh, the deep, different deep deployment options that we have and the flexibility that LoRaWAN uh, gives in this uh, area. So of course, uh, there are several coverage options, starting from private networks, but also moving gateways in trucks or trains or boats. Uh, nationwide public networks, of course, are also uh, an option and multi-country networks with roaming, and even today, satellite networks. In terms of features, also LoRaWAN sensors uh, offer different options, starting from the, the easiest one is presence, uh, outdoor geolocation, indoor location, temperature, shock, vibration, uh, many features are possible. So starting from the top left of this matrix, you can always find the best combination for your use case. And now uh, the panelists will give concrete examples of their solutions. So to start, let me hand over to uh, Karen Tilson from Senate. Thank you, Pierre. And thank you to the Laura Alliance for inviting Senate to participate on this panel today. Senate's a founding member and sponsor of the Laura Alliance. We operate the largest carrier grade Laura WAN network in the United States. And we provide LoRaWAN network coverage and connectivity readiness in over 80 countries. Our patent pending low power wide area virtual network has been recognized with several uh, industry innovation awards 
and we were recently issued an Enabling Technology Leadership Award for Water Utility Digital Networks by Prophet Sullivan. We also offer extreme flexibility in network deployment, as Pierre had alluded to. As I mentioned, one option is to deploy on our public network. Another option is to deploy on a private network. Now, these are owner-operated networks that leverage our cloud services and include data privacy and connectivity options for a variety of use cases. As a third option, we also offer flexibility and deployment to allow desired levels of access control and the opportunity to participate in our LVM revenue sharing model. We offer programs for customers looking to transition from developer networks, crowdsourced hotspots, and gateway-based network servers that aren't designed to support large-scale IoT deployments. Our managed network services ensure professional carrier-grade deployment, quality of service, security, and everything else necessary for mission-critical IoT service delivery and application support. Next slide, please, Pierre. So NanoThings, our partner, is a supply chain cold chain monitoring solution that uses proprietary sensor technology called NanoTags, that you see there on the left, to enable multi-leg source-to-store traceability. When NanoThings uh, first got started, they focused on trying to digitize print media. They looked to printed electronics because it allowed them to address size and cost constraints. The LoRaWAN protocol allowed them to downsize the battery and use a smaller form factor without sacrificing battery life or power. And in 2018, NanoThings made a pivot into the cold chain market when they were approached by U.S. cold storage. At the time, U.S. cold was using a manual process that involved attaching an analog data logger to a pallet, locating that pallet at the destination point, manually offloading the data using a special USB connector and software, and then emailing the reports to distribute the data. There was no cloud access, so the data was rarely, if ever, shared with the different parties in the chain. It took 10 to 20 minutes. It was expensive and error prone. The nano tag leveraging LoRaWAN automated all of this and it provided complete solutions for temperature monitoring. Now the image on the right is the NanoThings dashboard. So all the data is available in the cloud without anyone having to touch the tag. You literally set it and forget it. Next slide, please. So this matrix summarizes the different device types. We already touched on analog data loggers and near field communication and RFID tags are on the list only because their form factor is similar to the nano tag, which causes some to think they have similar capabilities. But the nano tag is almost as small as an RFID tag, but that's the only similarity. RFID and Bluetooth have limited read range and they're not well suited to supply chain temperature monitoring. Cellular, however, is appealing in that the connectivity solution is easier for consumers to digest, but cellular connectivity also has its issues. Typical battery life for a cell device is about two weeks, and supply chains can be months long. The nature of cold storage is that the part of some of the goods in the supply chain are being stored um, until the retail customer needs them. So the nanotag was really designed to support a long and variable supply chain. Cellular devices are expensive. Prices for the chips alone are five to 10 times that of a LoRaWAN chip. And the cell data plans are higher than the LoRaWAN plans. Tags used in cold chain are sealed in metal containers and LoRaWAN was designed to work in difficult environments. It performs well in a cold storage warehouse as well as in those refrigerated trucks. NanoThings provides touch point connectivity. So they realize 90% of the industry is interested in knowing what touch point their assets are at. Is it at the production facility? Did it leave the production facility? Is it in the 3PL? Did it finally make it to the store? And although cellular can provide real time visibility to the data, as we said, the cost can be five to 10 times that of LoRaWAN. And most temperature monitoring use cases really don't require that kind of real time data and nor does the user want to pay that kind of premium. Next slide, please. So let's take a look at a couple of NanoThings customers. Trident Seafoods is a family-owned business. Uh, founded in 1973, they've got $2.6 billion in sales and 9,000 employees. They process 500,000 metric tons of fish each year, 
And they're the largest vertically integrated seafood company in North America. And they also have locations in China, Europe, and Japan. U.S. Cold Storage manages more than 376 million cubic feet of temperature-controlled warehouse and distribution space in 42 facilities. Founded in 1964, they're the third largest public refrigerated warehousing logistics provider in North America, employing more than 3,500 people. Now, these two companies represent two important segments of the cold chain, Trident as the food processor and U.S. Cold as the 3PL. When Trident used data loggers, the data was generated, but they never saw it. They would place the device on a shipment, and when it arrived, the retailer would remove the device, offload the data, and recycle the device back to the vendor. Once the data went into the supply chain, it never came back. With the NanoThing solution, Trident is now getting data on their product after it leaves their processing plant that they use to manage their quality. So for Trident and U.S. Coal, their shared value proposition is traceability and visibility throughout the supply chain. So if you'd like to learn more, or as you see here, see a demo, reach out to me using the email here on the screen or the one provided in your program, and I'll follow up with you to arrange a call. Thanks for attending, and I'll turn things over to Josh at Oxit. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, uh, it's really very interesting. I'm sure uh, you would have questions about the nanotype, maybe in the Q&A even, uh, uh, or later by email. Uh, and yeah, as you said, uh, let's hand over now to uh, Josh from Oxit, uh, who will uh, present his uh, company and his solution for supply chain. Beautiful. Um, thanks for having me today. I'll start off with a brief on who we are and um, really how Oxid enables success with an IoT. Uh, Oxid's an IoT engineering services company. We mainly focus on two verticals. Uh, one, custom sensor development, so helping customers and companies chart, uh, solve unique challenges when it comes to collecting data, as well as system integration, so taking off-the-shelf components and not just capturing, but uh, also collecting and, and acting on that data. Uh, we've been in the IoT space now for a little over a decade, uh, particularly on the LoRa. We've been doing that for about seven years. 200,000 plus connected uh, devices across hundreds of products. Uh, today, I'm just going to jump into really the areas that uh, Oxit leverages LoRa WAN and really how we create value and uh, succeeding with IoT. So, I guess the really, um, let me, sorry. Switch slides on me there. So how do you succeed with IoT? Um, really comes down to ensuring that the, the value of the data uh, generates and outweighs the cost to capture it. Kind of simple concept, but the cost to capture the data is, comes down to infrastructure, maintenance, cost of the sensors. And this is one of the places where I think LoRaWAN really shines. Um, due to the immense range, you get less gateways, uh, less maintenance due to less equipment. Uh, generally, that's, that's one of the, the big pros to us. Uh, so, so we at Oxit leverage the, the LoRaWAN spec, and because it's an open standard, you get a diverse set of sensors you need to, to collect the data uh, and make the improvements you're looking to accomplish. So the types of data um, can it be everything from when product is consumed off the shelf, locations of a pallet at a port, or when a machine is running or not on your assembly line. We really want to capture, though, the right data, specific and timely. So it's, it's worth mentioning, though, that risk reduction, it comes from using an open standard like LoRaWAN, where you're not locked into one vendor to provide these sensors. So with the hurdles minimized on capturing the data, you can focus on the value you're generating, like just in, better just-in-time manufacturing, improved quality, uh, throughput, et cetera. So simply put, ensuring that the value of the data outweighs the cost to capture it, is how to be successful. Next slide. We're really seeing though the supply chain game is, is changing. Uh, I think it's allowing a, a new competitive edge due to greater accessibility to the right data. Uh, you've got lower cost sensors, cheaper networks, standardization, and powerful tools now all at our fingertips. And a, a supply chain is much like a city. You've got products and people uh, going in and out each, each of these segments having their own unique challenges. And what we, we at Oxit try to do is, is help companies um, within these cities, giving them the right tools and avoiding siloed data, which, where each individual business unit, like manufacturing or warehousing, is solving their issues, 
but not allowing that data to aggregate up so that the business can get a comprehensive data view of what's going on. And so to really get that competitive edge, we need that comprehensive data, that macro view of what's going on, and then we need to generate value from that. You know, using retail product consumption to drive manufacturing and distribution improvements from forecasting and production volumes. We can today make adjustments on what we build and when we build it based on products and when they're being consumed and do that now at a cost point that's just never been seen before. Um, we at Oxid have operationalized many solutions within a few months and see return on investments within a less than a year. And with that new visibility, you get better cash management, increased customer experience, et cetera. So we're really looking at this pandemic as a great opportunity to get out there and, and implement some new strategies and come out with a competitive edge. Uh, we're excited to be bringing that value to the supply chain and leveraging LoRaWAN for the enablement of low cost, long range, and a wide selection of sensors. Um, thanks for having me and I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Pierre. Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, very interesting as well. Uh, and uh, now let me hand over to uh, Jay for Vianix. Okay. Thank you, Pierre. So Vianix is a full service IoT firm and uh, we've been around for about eight years now. Um, as an American dream, I started the company in the basement and uh, now we are globally about 40 employees. And <clears throat> what we have done is we have actually created a complete end-to-end -end solution um, house where we start with sensors and we design all the sensors or if you use third party sensors, then we switch to the network, then we switch to the cloud services, then we have our own platform and then we also have drag and drop, drop dashboards which can pretty much be ready in less than 24 hours for any use case for any pilots. So we basically come and provide you one stop solution for endless solutions. Next slide for you please. Some of our solutions, which have already been deployed in several companies and uh, even the government and the uh, US Navy, uh, we have indoor and outdoor asset tracking. We are doing theft prevention. We are doing smart restrooms. Believe it or not, we're monitoring tissue paper and toilet paper in the restrooms. Uh, we're doing pallet panic alert for hospitality agency. We're doing pallet tracking, medical IoT for tracking food, medicines, wheelchairs in, inside a hospital, and smart HVAC and building management. And all these solutions use LoRa uh, significantly as that is the most uh, efficient way to do all these things. Uh, so uh, in the next slide, we'll go over into more pallet tracking. So uh, Bionics partners with uh, other companies in individual verticals for pallet tracking in case we have partnered with Pallet Alliance. Uh, and Pallet Alliance rotates a lot of pallets throughout the year. So uh, Vionix and Pallet Alliance partnered up in providing pallet tracking and pallet uh, awareness solution for, uh, for, for global uh, need. So how does it solve these problems? First, you have lost pallets in the recycling pool. Uh, and then you have a lost product in turn with that because uh, all the pallets are just not tracked. Plus, on the other hand, the pallet only cost $22, but how do you create a solution cheaper than that and you have a decent ROI on that pallet in a given time? Also, you have spoilage. So we have pallets which are equipped with uh, temperature logging and near real-time alerts on reporting. They have automatic temperature alerts and triggers if in case a pallet goes outside a certain temperature range or humidity range, doesn't matter where it is, in a warehouse or on a truck or at the end customer, we can alert uh, uh, management saying that this uh, particular thing is out of a certain range and it needs to be looked into immediately. Then also, it also provides supply chain visibilities and clears some inefficiencies where just-in-time also comes into play. So uh, inventory levels can be uh, minimized at the local level, dwell time, and also visibility while in transit. It also creates potential for visibility from time to time uh, for product to sell palletized to it reaches to the customer. Next slide, please. 
next slide. Next yeah, slide. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So one simple example, what we did with uh, one of our um, uh, customers uh, was a um, sample set of 50 sensors were equipped in the pallets and we introduced them into the supply chain, which was approximately the investment of about $5,000. Uh, which had a lower gateway, had some platform, and had about 50 sensors. And when we deployed it, uh, we successfully identified two, two sources of loss, one amounting to greater than $18,000 of lost new pallets per year. And then we went in back and said, okay, so how do we deploy that solution for uh, that particular customer uh, uh, for their whole company? and we were able to save more than $75,000 per year. And uh, after one year, when we did the calculations for the return, they pretty much get 15X return in one year by just doing pallet tracking in a way and saving all their goods. So that's just a small case study for the pallet, but there are lots of other solutions which Lora Alliance and Lora Van Technology solves. Um, I'll uh, give it back to Pierre and uh, We'll open for questions. Thank you very much, Jay. Very interesting, impressive ROI, by the way, uh, uh, definitely. So yeah, now we'll, um, uh, we have time for, for question and answers. And uh, um, yeah, so maybe, um, uh, one first question. You said very briefly, uh, uh, Jay, that uh, you can uh, start a project in less than 24 hours. Uh, uh, is it is it real? <laughs> is it true? Can you yeah, give uh, can you give examples or elaborate a little bit more on that? Sure. So uh, let's so so with any project, we have two big problems, right? Um, there are a lot of a lot of platform providers that say yes, we are ready to go with the platform and everything. But again, they have to do a lot of engineering on the front end, how the data is going to get displayed, how the data is not going to display. Um, we do have a platform which where you can literally just drag and drop uh, many widgets, maps, whatever you want to, just connect the sensor data, and you're pretty much ready to go. If let's say if somebody wants to do GPS tracking with LoRa, right? So we have a LoRa GPS tracker and we can track it in less than 24 hours. If you want to do tank monitoring, we have tank monitoring. If you want toilet paper monitoring, we have toilet paper monitoring, right? But tomorrow you come and say, okay, I want to count number of leaves on a tree, just for an example, right? So uh, we don't have a sensor for that yet, correct? Or I don't have it yet. And my next thing is I go find any third party, if any third party has a sensor. If there is no sensor, then we get into a big R&D stage where we have to develop the sensor, correct? So that's the time where it takes more time for us to actually deploy a solution. But if there is an off-the-shelf sensor or we have an internal sensor existing, we can actually deploy it fairly quickly and show the customer that we are getting this data very quickly. So like we have one device which is called VXDLS, which stands for Bluetooth, LoRa, and S stands for sensor. So the way it is made and modular, it has three different modules and sensors keep changing in that. Uh, there are about 28,000 combinations of different sensors we can connect to, to monitor whatever we want to monitor. Great, thank you. So, so it's, uh, it's real, except if you don't have the sensor at all, of course, so you have to redevelop that. I understand. Um, uh, do the others want to comment on this uh, time to start a POC? I don't know, Josh or Karen, do you have any comment on this? I think proof of concept, the actual starting of the proof of concept, uh, Pierre, is, is going to vary by the, uh, the client's readiness and the client's understanding of what it is they're trying to uh, prove out with their proof of concept. From a network connectivity standpoint, as I said, we've got public network. We can literally engage in a proof of concept, connect your sensors uh, you know, in a day. It's simply a matter of registering those sensors on our public network and you have connectivity. I think the real challenge on a proof of concept is understanding what you're trying to prove. Um, mm -hmm. what, what value, what results, what are you testing? Uh, and then I think once you've done that work, uh, sort of the mechanics of it um, in terms of getting your devices connected on our network are very straightforward. 
Yeah, you're right. The, the business value uh, is is the most important, and uh, and and yeah, proving this in a in a POC is the key, and and knowing what is a success a POC success is very important. Josh, yeah, I think. Did, did, yeah. I was going to hit on, I mean, yeah, I think we're in a really interesting place, right? Because the accessibility to these tools is, is really powerful right now. We've never had this much accessibility to this data. Um, as far as the speed, yeah, I mean, it, it's right in line. I think, uh, you know, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of these guys go out, though, they're, when they're trying to solve a problem um, and that kind of thing. And I think what we're trying to push is just to making sure that, you know, you get that data and you have that available for higher level analytics that you need to drive later down the path of creating that competitive edge. Um, you know, I think we, we, it's interesting though how often too we see companies actually migrating from off the shelf sensors to custom development, right? Because maybe they want this, you know, multiple sensors in one kind of kit with an extremely long battery life. And so you get into those optimization standpoints, but from uh, getting in system operational, yeah, I mean, it's a, this is a great time to be out there trying to solve unique challenges because you can get these things and plug them up and be running in, a, in an afternoon. Great. Uh, staying with you, Josh, uh, you mentioned uh, the benefits of uh, uh, interoperability and availability of different uh, sensors from different vendors. C can you uh, elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, well, I think, you know, going back to that silo data is, you know, what you really want to avoid for us is, is going out there and getting a solution that'll keep your data hostage. Um, and, and we see that happen a lot when you have individual business units going out there and solving problems all by themselves and they go out and they just buy whatever gizmo or gadget they can find. Um, but when you look at the management over a lifetime, each one, of those gadget, each one of those gadgets comes with its own gateway. And you end up with just all this infrastructure that's overkill. It's not really necessary. And I think anytime you can push towards using an open standard, um, I always pick on the example, but imagine if you know, every device you bought to plug into your computer just had a different cable, right? It didn't use USB. I know we're going through that shift now of changing, but it's for the better. And I think when I look at Lura, man, it's, it's a lot of that saying better, right? Let's, let's get off of those archaic systems with the vendor lock-in and get into open standards, interoperability. Um, I think the other side of that coin too is just availability of sensors. If someone doesn't make what you want, they can make it to work with your existing LoRaWAN infrastructure. And you also have all these companies out there making these products that over time, you're going to see the sensors come out that you need to, to solve your unique challenges. Um, you know, when, when we started out, you know, you saw the temp humidity. Now we've got the ultrasonic and, you know, you start seeing these gradual movements towards the sensors you need, and it's just plug and play with that infrastructure you already have. Great. Yeah, you're right that, that of course, mutualizing the infrastructure makes a lot of sense and is, is a great uh, chance we have with, uh, with LoRaWAN. I have a few questions now more specific on the nano tag, maybe for you, Karen. Um, can you uh, elaborate a little bit more on the, on the life, lifetime of, uh, of these tags? the temperature range uh, and uh, whether they are really uh, uh, disposable or, or do they have to be recycled? Or okay. How is it working? Those are great questions, yeah. So the tag life is 50,000 transmissions. So this isn't a one-to-one -one, uh, with temperature reading as you can send multiple temperature readings in a single packet. Uh, which is why the nano tag um, has a multi-year tag life. Uh, the temperature range on the low end, it operates at uh, 40 degrees centigrade, which I'm told is uh, also 40 degrees Fahrenheit. I think that's the only time that centigrade and Fahrenheit uh, are, uh, are, are the same. Uh, and then at the high end, it's 85 degrees centigrade or 185 degrees Fahrenheit. So a broad range of um, supply chain environments. Uh, in the cold chain, most, in, most of the industry ships between uh, 10 below to 20 below on the Fahrenheit schedule. And that's an extreme challenge for most connected solutions. But as we all know here, uh, um, LoRaWAN works very well in extreme environments. And then on, uh, and then on the disposability question, um, on the recycle question, 
Uh, one of the major value props on the tag is its disposability. It was a, originally designed to be thrown away because the intent was to put it on magazines and track magazines and when people opened them. Uh, but it's designed with non-toxic materials. Uh, the company would prefer that you would recycle it like you would any electronic, but if it got thrown out, they can, they've got uh, proprietary software. They can download some instructions to the battery, drain it, uh, so that uh, all the energy is out of the battery, and then it, it can be, it can even be shredded at that point. Okay, great. Um, any closing remark from uh, Jay or Josh? As Thanks for having us. <laughs> yeah, I think time is uh, time is uh, up now. So thank you very much, and uh, we are available for follow up follow ups and and questions, of course, offline. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.